scripture reading this morning is Matthew 4, 12, 23. And I will be reading from the Common English Bible. Now, when Jesus heard that John was arrested, he went to Galilee. He left Nazareth and settled in Capernaum, which lies alongside the sea in the area of Nephilim and Naphtali. This fulfilled what Isaiah the prophet said. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, alongside the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who live in the dark have seen a great light, and the light has come upon those who live in this region and in the shadow of death. From that time, Jesus began to announce, Change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus walked alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea because they were fishermen. Come follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and followed him. Continuing on, he saw another set of brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with Zebedee, their father, repairing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. He announced the good king news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among people. May God bless those who heard the reading of the scripture. Amen. Amen. It is so good to be here this morning. Uh, as I said, this is the third Sunday after Epiphany and the first Sunday before the Super Bowl. <laughs> so shout out to the Niners fans, even though that is hard for me as a Cowboy fan. And I so look forward to seeing you all back here next week because surely, sh I mean surely, no one would skip church on Super Bowl Sunday. So as is the case during this season of Epiphany, I decided to go along with the lectionary text this time in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I've not fully decided yet, but maybe during the Lenten season as we um, approach Sundays, we might switch it up and do things thematically, maybe explore forgiveness or, or prayer or something, and that might be reinforced throughout the week, so it would not be a lectionary, but for now, as someone who didn't necessarily grow up in like high church with a calendar and a lectionary and all that type of talk, I enjoy going by the lectionary. Because every time I look and see, you know, what the verse is, it's like a Christmas gift. It's like a new surprise. You know, some stories and verses are more familiar than others, but yet there's this special feeling of knowing that there's a crowd of people all throughout Christendom who's exploring this topic at the same time as we are. Um, so today we'll be briefly looking at themes of casting our nets and discipleship as we think about lessons by the lake shore. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, in this moment we just open up our hearts, willing to receive that which you have for us to receive that we might be better equipped to be love and grace in this world. For this now in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So today's Matthew text, in alignment with the other synoptic gospels, has Jesus starting his public ministry in Galilee after he left this small mountainous hometown of Nazareth. He ends up in Capernaum. And it's this fishing village established on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is really a large freshwater lake in northern Israel. It was just there back in May. Do you have a picture? Okay, we'll keep that picture, but I think there was another one. That's fine. Okay. There, go back. Yeah, that's a picture. And if you notice the quality 
of the shop, I was framing it just <laughs> like that. No. I was <laughs> so, but Capernaum, it was interesting. Archaeological evidence demonstrates that the town was established about uh, second century BC. You can go back to the other shop, yeah. Um, and there was a lot of fishing village that were established at that time, about 1,500 people there. Um, if you can kind of see in the back, there is a house that kind of turned into a church, and they believe that that site right there is where Peter's home is. And as some of you do not know, I get really excited with any story that mentions um, the disciple Peter. Um, and it's not because he's my namesake. It's exactly because <laughs> he's my namesake. Um, what you don't see, just a little bit off of this picture, is um, archaeological excavations have revealed the, ru the ruins of one of the oldest synagogues in the world. It is most likely the site of the synagogue from the first century, the one where Jesus begins his teaching and healing ministry. It's the one that's implied in the, in the last verse of our reading where it says, uh, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, he announced the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among the people. Now, I have a lot of pictures of that temple, but we'll do that another time. Um, back to the text. So here we have Jesus walking along the lake shore, in many ways echoing the words of his cousin. As it says in the King James Version, it says, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? That's in the King James it says that. And scripture says that as Jesus walked alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, throwing their fishing nets into the sea. Because again, they were fishermen. They were casting their nets. I think I have a picture of some casting of nets, yeah. And as an aside, my birth name, my first name is Peter. My middle name, is Andrew. <laughs> so I doubly love this story. So Jesus says to them, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Or as we really popularly know that expression, I'll make you fishers of men. And right away they left their nets. I mean, right away they left their nets and followed Jesus. Well, continuing on, he ran into another set of brothers. James and John, they're in a boat with their father, Zebedee. And they were just preparing their nets. And Jesus called out to them in the same fashion that he called out to Peter and Andrew and, and said, come and follow me. And it says immediately, they left their boat and their dad and followed him. Now, this is just how I think about it. I know I'm supposed to be pious and not question these things, but is this story not a little bit weird to you? I mean, since this story and similar ones are set up as exemplars of good discipleship, in fact, this picture that you see is from the gathering of the Orders Conference that will be held this week in Livermore. This is a time where I, along with all the clergy from the Cal Nevada Conference, will be gathering together with the bishop and the theme of this year is casting our nets. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that later, and I'll definitely update you next week. But needless to say, this is a very pregnant metaphor, uh, and it's able to burn all manner of preaching gems of application for the life of the church. But is it all right if I just, just register my pause about how all this went down at the lake shore? I mean, you have dropped nets. You have poor Zebedee, right? He's a random, abandoned father in the boat. I mean, what's going on here? I mean, how is it that my namesake and his brother and some fellow fishermen just dropped their nets, implicitly dropping their livelihoods, and followed Jesus? Now wait a minute. Now trust me, I am not hating on the decision. But as someone who is married and know the mechanics of decision making and processes in the household, and I know Peter was married because later, you know, there's the miracle of Jesus healing his mother-in-law. 
But as someone who is happily married for 15 years and as someone who has lovingly learned the necessity of communication <laughs> and the need to at times defer, I always wonder how it was irresponsible at best, possibly even crazy, that these early disciples just dropped everything and followed this guy from the hills of Nazareth who they just happened to meet on the lake shore. So I read some interesting commentary about this. They talked about these early disciples' decisions to follow Jesus. And they, they said, in, in their high voices, they said, well, it should not be evaluated by the traditional types of reason found in Western philosophy, of thinking and doing and feeling. Their response was not, as they said, mediated, but more intuitive or reflective. It was even this evocation of Frederick Schleiermacher's concept at the, at the point in which the disciples had this feeling of absolute dependence, which is an immediate state of self-consciousness that evokes an immediate response, the consequences of which have yet to be disclosed. As such, it is a trusting onset of a journey rather than a conclusion of sorts. Now, that sounds great. I can unpack that, and as they say, that will preach. But still, I'm just kind of stuck with this image of this exchange at the lakeshore. And what does this have to say about what discipleship looks for us today? Well, it was then that I began to think about my time in Guatemala. I was there as part of a delegation from Pacific School of Religion. I was on the teaching team that was part of the they called the Change Maker Scholarship Program. And one of the things that we were tasked to do was to witness and advocate and kind of accompany migrants who were trekking El Norte. And at one point, we went to the banks of the river between Guatemala and Mexico, between Ciudad Tecunumán and Ciudad Hidalgo. Later, years later, this view all the caravan talk and stuff, so these are some of the origin points of where this was going down. So this was a river crossing. Mostly there were people ferrying people across the river to Mexico. But there were also some fishermen. And there's two things that I remember about being there. Number one, I remember the songs that we sung there, including the one that we will sing a little bit later. But I really remember these fishermen. And what I remember most was how they wasted nothing in their process of fishing. One would even describe what they were doing as kind of makeshift. There were buckets used in multiple ways. There were two liter bottles here and there. Milk cartons being used as bobbers. Rudimentary elements of plastics and ropes and twines that were creatively repurposed and used in the act of fishing. The point is, Nothing was wasted. And this allowed me to look back at the words of Jesus in the text. Jesus didn't just say, follow me, but he also said, I will make you fish for people. Listen, not everybody's faith journey is going to look like the dramatic, life-changing events of the disciples in which they seemingly put down their livelihoods and did something new. But that's okay. And who knows why these first disciples dropped everything to follow Jesus, especially when Jesus, to their knowing, hadn't done anything remarkable yet. I remember some pastors saying that maybe Jesus had this incredible charisma, the kind of person you just had to be near. Maybe. Others said that maybe these guys were just looking for a chance to start something new, and Jesus afforded them that opportunity. Maybe. But could it be that these few words of invitation, Jesus shows that they knew that he knew something about these guys. He knew who they were. He knew what they were capable of. He knew their skills. He knew their gifts. He knew their shortcomings. He knew their limitations. And somehow, through a simple command, communicated to them that he had a plan 
to take all of what they are and all of what they were and transform it into something spectacular in the work of creating this beloved community that he was preaching was at hand. Jesus says to them, the fishermen, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, meaning I will use all the skills that you learned at the sea, the patience, the discernment, the observation, and put it to work to transform the world. Why? Because like those fishermen in Guatemala, nothing in your life is ever wasted. Understand that's how God works. God doesn't waste anything. Not one second of our lives. Everything, even the things that you deem as your most colossal failures, even your deepest regrets, everything is something that God can and will use. This goes back to what we talked about last week with the redemption songs, right? Yeah. Maybe the dropping of nets signifies releasing our attachments to what those things in our past lives has represented to us. God wants to use us, but there are some stories that we tell ourselves about who we are or our own limitations or our own fears that we need to drop like nets, like those that Peter and Andrew dropped on those shoulders. And in those acts of release and surrender, God doesn't just throw away those experiences. No. Even the bad stuff, even the stuff that we are ashamed of, God redeems it and says to us, nothing is wasted. I know you. I am calling you. Now take all of what you have and follow me and watch what we'll do together. This life in this new follow me stage is what this denomination is going through. As we are in the process of dropping our nets of what we have been to embracing this adventure of following God into something new. But whether we're talking about this denomination or this church or our own personal lives, I am confident in this. If we walk with Jesus on the lake shore, then the grace of God goes with us. It provides all that we need if we allow it and if we say yes to it. And being a disciple is not being a robot. It's going to look differently for different people. And if saying yes to God and following Christ into life, what that does is empowers us to express our highest and best selves in the world for the sake of healing, for the sake of service, for the sake of love, for the sake of grace, for the sake of doing things like doing justice. Yes. So, what do you need to say yes to today? Everything. Where do you hear God calling you in the life of discipleship? What needs are in this church or this community or in the wider world that cries out to your heart? What nets or stories do you need to drop in order to live fully into what God has for you? If we can begin to answer and then live into these questions, then we will be well on our way to receiving the needed lessons that was once given on that ancient Galilean lakeshore. And God will definitely go with us. But please just remember this one thing. Please consult your spouse before making a life decision. <laughs> and never abandon your father all alone in the world. It's just, it's just not a good one. Amen? <laughs>